Let's open up our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Tonight we're going to begin at verse 20, and we'll take it uh, as long as I have voice and you all seem to be attentive. Uh, We might make it through the end of the chapter. And what a chapter we have in front of us tonight. Now, in our previous time together, we went through the first 19 verses of this chapter where Paul was dealing with the issue of the resurrection. It's important to notice that among all the messed up areas that the Corinthian church was off in, one of the most significant was was they were off in their understanding of the resurrection. It wasn't so much that they denied the resurrection of Jesus Christ, more so they denied the believer's resurrection. They lost sight of that essential truth among Christians that we will rise from the dead in what the Bible refers to as a resurrection body. And this is a very important teaching, and through the first 19 verses of the chapter, which we covered the last time we were together, Paul very carefully explained the fact that there must be a resurrection, because if there was no resurrection, then Jesus wouldn't have risen from the dead. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead proves, it demonstrates, that there is a resurrection. Now, he's going to now begin in verse 20 to apply the principle of Jesus' resurrection to our own resurrection. Take a look here, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 20. But now, Christ is risen from the dead. Oh, I love that. I love how he begins right there. You know, in the previous part of the chapter, Paul demonstrated beyond all doubt that Jesus rose from the dead. He demonstrated it from logic. He demonstrated from the scriptures. He called forth witnesses, the apostles, 500 people who saw him at any one time, his own testimony. Paul called forth all kinds of witnesses and established it beyond any matter of doubt. He's done discussing the issue right here in verse 20. He just states the fact, but now Christ is risen from the dead. Well, so what? He goes on. Now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits. Afterward, those who are Christ at his coming. Friends, in these verses, Paul tells us a very important principle relating the resurrection of Jesus Christ to our own resurrection, and it's simply this. Jesus is the first fruits of our resurrection. Now, when Paul uses that term first fruits, he's using a term in the original Greek language that really had two kind of meanings. The word that he uses in the Old Testament was used for the Feast of First Fruits, which was celebrated by Israel. You know, every year they would have Passover, and right after Passover, they would begin the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. And then on the day after the Sabbath, after Passover, okay, you take Passover, take the next Sabbath, the day after that Sabbath would be the Feast of First Fruits. And you know what you would do on the Feast of First Fruits? You would bring an offering to God. But was it an offering of blood? Was it a bull or a ram or a goat? No, it was not. The offering on the Feast of First Fruits was a sheaf of grain. You would take the best first grain that came up from your fields, cut it down, and bring it in and offer it before the Lord. Now, that took faith, first of all, because you're cutting down the best grain already, right? But it was also a way of saying, Lord, you have provided this. We trust that you're going to provide the rest of the harvest. You've given us the first fruits. We'll give the first fruits back unto you. And we believe that you are going to provide the rest of the harvest. Friends, Jesus Christ is the first fruits of our resurrection. His resurrection anticipates our resurrection. It represents our resurrection. Just as the first fruits were offered to God, and because of that they were assured the rest of the harvest. So Jesus is the first one resurrected from the dead, and his resurrection anticipates and represents our resurrection. Now let me blow your mind just for a minute, friends. Do you realize what day Jesus rose from the dead on? There was the Passover, then there was a Sabbath, and what was the day after the Sabbath? Sunday. That was the day the Feast of First Fruits was celebrated. Friends, Jesus rose from the dead on the day of the Feast of First Fruits. 
And he did it as our first fruits. He was the first fruits of the resurrection. And the offering at the Feast of First Fruits was a bloodless grain offering. No atoning sacrifice was necessary because the Passover lamb had just been sacrificed. And this corresponds perfectly with the resurrection of Jesus because his death ended the need for sacrifice. He provided a perfect and a complete atonement. So friends, Jesus is our first fruits in the sense of the Feast of First Fruits. But let me give it to you in another way also. Jesus is our first fruits in the other way that the word was used in the ancient world. See, in the ancient world, in the secular usage, they would use that term first fruits, or the Greek word representing the word, for an entrance fee. When you go in and pay an entrance fee into something, a membership fee, you'd pay that, and they'd call that the first fruits. The uh, arpeke is what they would call it in the original language. Well, friends, Jesus is our entrance fee into the resurrection. He's the way. He paves the way. He's the first fruits. And so Paul goes on to say here that Jesus is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For by for since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. By Adam, that is the one man, he's one head of the human race, and all mankind was brought under death by Adam. But the second Adam, Jesus Christ, is the other head of the human race, and he brings us into resurrection. My friends, I want you to think of Jesus as, well, as the ultimate Christopher Columbus, as the ultimate uh, Neil Armstrong. You know, we admire these men who discover new worlds, who go places where no person has ever gone before. Jesus Christ is the great navigator of resurrection. He's gone there before us and has explored the territory and mapped it all out for us. And he says, you come follow me. Adam led you into death and and sin and, and depravity. I'll lead you into the glorious new country of resurrection. So friends, in Christ, all shall be made alive, he says there in verse 21. Now friends, when he says, excuse me, in verse 22, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. When Paul says that, does he mean that everybody's resurrected unto glorious eternal life in Jesus Christ? No. Friends, when Paul uses all in verse 22, when he says, even so in Christ, all shall be made alive, He doesn't mean every human being in the sense he means most focused right here. He's talking about the resurrection of the blessed, the resurrection of the righteous. That's his focus in this whole part of the chapter. Paul isn't really dealing with the resurrection of the wicked. He isn't dealing with the resurrection of the unrighteous. However, we should remind ourselves that the Bible says there is a resurrection of condemnation. Can I tell you the words of Jesus in John chapter 5 verse 29? Jesus spoke of the resurrection of life and the resurrection of condemnation. And friends, even as every believer right now anticipates receiving a new body perfectly suited to enjoy the environment of eternity in heaven, even so, every person who rejects Jesus Christ will receive a body that is capable of surviving the horrors of hell for eternity. Oh, there is a resurrection of condemnation. There is a resurrection of the wicked. But that's not what Paul has in view in verse 22. When he says, even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. He's talking about those who are alive in Christ. But notice he says in verse 23, but each one in his own order. Listen, none of us should be resurrected before Jesus. He's the captain of our salvation. We let him go first. He's the trailblazer. He's the great explorer of that land beyond. And we receive it afterward at the coming of Jesus. Now, let's make it clear. Nobody was resurrected before Jesus. There's an order in place here, my friends. You say, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, David. I read my Bible. There were people resurrected before Jesus. I read in 1 Kings chapter 17 how Elisha raised the widow's son from the dead. I read in John chapter 11 how, um, uh, what's his name, Lazarus was raised from the dead before, uh, before the time of Jesus, before Jesus' resurrection. What is it? Jesus wasn't the first one raised from the dead. I didn't say Jesus was the first one raised from the dead. I said Jesus was the first one resurrected. My friends, there's a difference. To be raised from the dead means you rise again to die again. What a bummer. (laughs) You got to die twice. How about that? You want that in your life? I tell you, the most depressed man who ever lived was Lazarus. There he is enjoying the glories of heaven. 
Then all of a sudden, you know, wait, wait, what's happening? <laughs> Next thing you know, he's walking out of the tomb. Jesus is saying, Lazarus, come forth. I love, Lazarus was not a happy man. I mean, he did it to glorify God, I'm sure. And I'm sure he had a good attitude about it all. <laughs> but leave it up to Lazarus. You know, I'd never want to die again. I'll just stay here in my new body. But my friends, resurrection isn't just living again. It's living again in a new body. A new body based on our old body. But it's a new body perfectly suited for eternity. Jesus was not the first one brought back from the dead, but he was the first one resurrected. The resurrection of Jesus leads to the resolution of all things, as Paul will explain here at verse 24, where he says, Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him, who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Friends, those are some glorious words. Do you see verse 24 there? I love those words. Then comes the end. Yes, my friends, verse 23 left with the thought of Christ at his coming. And after the return of Jesus Christ, then comes the end. And what's going to happen at the end? Look at it in verse 24, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. My friends, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10 describes for us God's eternal purpose in history. Let me read it to you. That in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth in him. God's eternal purpose is this great gathering together of everything, of everything and all creation in Jesus Christ, the summing up of all things in him. And here in 1 Corinthians, Paul looks forward to the time when all things are resolved in Jesus Christ, and he presents it all to God the Father, giving glory to the God who authored this eternal plan of the ages. There's going to come a day when it's finished, friends. When every wrong has been righted, when every right has been rewarded, when it's all sorted out, when the wicked are punished and the just are rightly compensated. Friends, it's all going to happen one day. Jesus Christ is going to make sense of it all. He's going to draw it all together, summing it up in all one coherent package. And he's going to present it all, so to speak, to God the Father. And he's going to establish his rule and reign over all things. Did you notice this in verse 24? When he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. Yes, my friends, for now God has granted a measure, a measure of rule and authority and power. Men have a measure of rule and authority and power. Satan has a measure of rule and authority and power. Even death has a measure of rule and authority and power. But those days are numbered. It's all temporary. One day Jesus Christ is going to take his rightful place, as 1 Timothy 6 says, as the blessed and only potentate, as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And friends, after the resurrection, God's going to finally resolve all of human history according to his will. Friends, when Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, it set in motion a chain of events that has to culminate in the final destruction of death and God reigning as supreme over everything. Friends, it's it's done, man. It's happened. It's a gimme. It's set in motion. There's no way it can happen any other way. God is going to triumph and show his perfect triumph over all things. As a matter of fact, it says here in verse 25 that he must reign. I love that. He must reign. You know, Jesus said that the Son of Man must suffer at the hands of men and be crucified. And we were like, oh, oh, Lord. And then we read this and we rejoice. Yeah, he must reign. Just as certainly as he must suffer, he must reign. And he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Friends, here Paul refers to the thousand-year reign of Jesus described in Revelation chapter 20. And after that time, there will be a final Satan-inspired rebellion, which Jesus will crush finally and forever, and he will put all enemies under his feet. That's a figure from the Old Testament of total and complete conquest. Jesus is going to be victor over it. And you see what he's going to do to establish his victory last of all? Look at verse 26. 
the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Let me tell you something, friends. When Jesus Christ returns to this earth, there's still going to be death. When Jesus Christ rules and reigns over this earth for a thousand years, there's still going to be death. Oh, death will be different. God will extend the lifespan of man again. In Isaiah, it says that the man who lives to be a hundred and dies will be thought to be just a kid. Oh yeah, God will extend it, but there will still be death. Death will not be abolished until after the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Friends, death is the last enemy that will be destroyed. There's going to come a day when death is abolished. Now, you and I can hardly think of that. Friends, we think of this as the land of the living. It's not the land of the living. It's the land of the dying. Look out across a cemetery. Look out across a hospital or a rest home. And there's death, death everywhere. One day, God's going to say, no more death. That's it. It's gone. He set this fact in motion already, but he's going to accomplish it eternally one day. Friends, did you notice the words of verse 26? Did you see how it described death as your friend? No. Death is your enemy. A little while before, we were talking about Lazarus. I was having trouble coming up with his name, but (laughs) we remember when Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus in John chapter 11, when he came upon that tomb, the Bible says that he groaned in the spirit and that he was troubled. And it says that Jesus wept. Why? Why? Jesus, you're going to raise the guy from the dead in five minutes. Why are you so upset? Oh, poor Lazarus, he's dead. No, I don't think so, my friends. Jesus knew he was going to raise him from the dead. You know what Jesus was so troubled at? Friends, simply the fact of death itself. It was an enemy. And as it were, Jesus could look over this vast wasteland, not the land of the living, the land of the dying and the dead. And he knew that death was an enemy that must be conquered. Today, some people are told to embrace death as a friend. But friends, that's not biblical thinking. Death is an enemy. But I want to praise God right now for the believer. It's a defeated enemy. It's defeated because of the work of Jesus. And it's an enemy that will one day be destroyed. So it's an enemy we need not fear. But it's an enemy nonetheless. You know, the destruction of death was shown at the resurrection of Jesus. I think this is wild. To me, this is one of the most amazing passages in the whole New Testament. Matthew chapter 27, where it says that after Jesus rose from the dead, the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went to the holy city and appeared to many. It's as if reverberations went out through the world of the spirit and the, the resurrection of Jesus unleashed a force and Well, a few people just had to get it. Maybe those who were geographically close to the tomb of Jesus, they just caught some of that resurrection power and they were resurrected right then and there. And well, they hung out in Jerusalem for a while. I don't know, they got a falafel or something. And then after a while, they just went to heaven. The Bible didn't say they died again. I believe they received the resurrection bodies. That's how powerful, that's the demonstrating the death, the, the, the destruction of death, I should say. Friends, those were just sort of some preliminary skirmishes, mere foreshadowings of the great victory by which death was overthrown. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I don't know, David, I don't get this. Death destroyed? Friends, death is destroyed, but if death is destroyed, why do Christians die? Friends, I want you to understand something. Death is not a penalty put upon Christians by God. That's not death in the life of the believer, friends. No, my friends. In that sense, God has forever abolished death, and God will never, never kill a believer in punishment. Then why do the saints die? Why do they die at all? Well, because our bodies have to be changed before they can enter heaven. It's not so much that we die. We're dissolved and we depart. Yes, we're changed. We're transformed. But friends, don't miss it. Death is an enemy. Now, I had something just marvelous suggested to me by a sermon of Charles Spurgeon's in this. He points out the fact that death is an enemy, right? 
But don't go around thinking that death is your worst enemy. As a matter of fact, death is far to be preferred than some of your other enemies that face you. He says it, would be, it were better to die a thousand times than to sin. To be tried by death is nothing compared to being tempted by the devil. The mere physical pains connected with dissolution are comparative trifles compared with the hideous grief which is caused by sin and the burden which a sense of guilt causes the soul. Oh, friends, death is an enemy, but it's not your worst enemy. Sin, guilt, alienation from God, far worse enemies to us than death itself. Now, one more thing before we go on to the next verse. Did you notice that verse 26 tells us that death is the last enemy to be destroyed? Don't worry if you don't feel death has been destroyed for you. It's the last. Don't dispute God's appointed order. Let last be last. You may want to wipe out death right now. No, friends, it's the last. You're worried about your death right now? You want, will I make it? I don't know. What if I renounce Christ on my deathbed? Don't worry about that. Don't feel like you need to have dying grace before you die. Seek God right now for living grace. Glorify Jesus Christ right now, and you're going to have dying grace when the time for dying comes. If you'll seek the Lord for living grace right now. I want you to notice verses 27 and 28, because I think these are important. It says, but when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. This has been a source of confusion to some people, what Paul means here, but really it's very simple. Paul has pointed out the scriptural things that the scriptural truth that all things will be put in subjugation to Jesus Christ. But Paul doesn't want us to think that there will ever come a day, either in time or eternity, when the Father himself will be put in subjugation to the Son. No, my friends. The Father will always be the Father, and the Son will always be the Son. The relationship of Father to Son will be eternal. The Bible says, the Son Himself will also be subject to Him, in verse 28. And you should know that those who deny the deity of Jesus Christ say that this verse proves their point. They take the submission of God the Son as proof that He must not be equal in deity to God the Father. But friends, the submission of Jesus to the Father doesn't come because He's inferior to the Father. Instead, it just comes from the administrative order of the Godhead. A son is always in submission to his father, even if both are equal in substance. So friends, this isn't a problem here. Simply put, God the Father will always be God the Father. And God the Son will always be God the Son. And for all of eternity, they will continue to relate to each other as Father and Son. Why? Notice here, verse 28, that God may be all in all. Do you know what Paul's referring to there? He's referring to the Son's desire to glorify God the Father throughout all eternity. It's as if the Son says, yes, I'm going to sum up all things into myself and all things will be put under my feet and then you know what I'm going to do with it all? I'm going to come and present it to God the Father and put it all under Him so that God the Father may be all in all. You know what blows my mind about this passion in God the Son to glorify God the Father? Because when you read the Bible, all the persons of the Godhead are interested in glorifying somebody else. I mean, the Son glorifies the Father, the Father glorifies the Son, and the Holy Spirit glorifies the Son. And this aspect of the nature of God is something that God wants you and I to walk in. You know what? Don't worry about glorifying yourself. Why don't you be concerned about glorifying somebody else? Now, I mean glorifying the Lord, but why not glorifying another person? Why not building them up, lifting them up? If we have a concern for the glory of others and not our own, God will make sure that we receive whatever glory we need, which isn't much, is it? <laughs> 
Verse 29. Paul is going to continue on with some more reasons to believe in the principle of resurrection. He says, otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If in the manner of men I have fought with the beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Now here Paul presents three more very persuasive reasons why we should believe in the resurrection. First of all, he says, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Well, the baptism for the dead proves that there's a resurrection. All right, next point here in verse... Oh, did you want me to talk about the baptism of the dead? (laughs) Well, this, of course, has been a troubling verse to many people. Baptism of the dead, what's that? Now, we know what the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, otherwise known as the Mormons, believe it is. You may have relatives of yours who have been baptized uh, in absentia by the Mormons. They have ceremonies at the Mormon temple where you go through your whole genealogy. That's why Mormons are into genealogies. They list the whole genealogy and you baptize yourself or somebody else for a dead person. And they supposedly get this from this passage of scripture. My friends, can I just tell you that this is a pagan custom? So, well, wait a minute, it's not a pagan custom. It's mentioned in the Bible. Yes, it's mentioned in the Bible, but as a pagan custom. (laughs) Can I just point something out to you very plainly in verse 29? Let me emphasize it to you as I read it. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized? Does Paul say we baptize for the dead? Does he say you baptize for the dead? No, he says they baptize for the dead. Not people in the church. Not you, not we, but they Baptism for the dead was a strange pagan custom at that time. But what it did was it reflected a belief in the resurrection. You know what Paul's saying here? He's saying, can I paraphrase just a little bit? He's saying, you Corinthian morons. <laughs> That's a little paraphrase. You Corinthians, he's saying. Even your pagan neighbors believe in the resurrection of the dead, but you don't. Your pagan neighbors baptized for the dead. That proves they believe in the resurrection of the dead. But you don't. Wake up. Please, nobody should think for a moment that Paul is saying that Christians should be baptizing for the dead. or that's any. He very pointedly makes the, the grammatic point, they, not we or you. So that's one reason. He says, listen, we can believe in the resurrection of the dead. Even the pagans believe in it. Then he goes on to say, verse 30, and why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? Friends, if there were no resurrection, why would Paul place his life in jeopardy for the gospel? The way that Paul lived his life all out for the gospel was evidence of the truth of the resurrection. And friends, let's just be straight right now. Most of us are so concerned about living comfortable lives here on earth that our lives give no evidence of the resurrection. But if you looked at Paul's life, you know what you'd say? You'd say, you know what? If there's not a resurrection and a reward, that guy's nuts. There's no way anybody would give up what he's given up or live the way he lives unless there was a resurrection of the dead. No way. Paul lived that all out for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say, I love this, verse 31. (laughs) I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now stop right there. Paul's going to boast. He's going to brag. Now the Corinthians were used to braggers. The Corinthians had plenty of those slick kind of ministers. You see the same kind today. $2,000 suits. Big gold bracelet on their wrist. Big enough to choke a horse. Flamboyant gestures, perfectly quaffed hair, everything, you know, image, image, image. You look at him and say, man, that's success. That's power. That's charisma. And they like to brag, don't they? 
They like to brag about their money and their cars and their big things. And they like to boast. Hey, the Corinthian Christians had ministers like that. They knew what boasting was all about. And Paul says, oh, oh, I want to boast. Can I boast? I want to brag now. All right, Paul, do your bragging. What's his bragging? Verse 31, I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. That's Paul's boast. You know what he meant by that? He meant by that that he was in constant peril of his life. Paul's life was lived so on the edge for Jesus Christ that he could say, I die daily. His life was always on the line. You know, a pretty dramatic example of this. In Acts chapter 23, check this out. How would you like this? More than 40 men took a vow. You know what their vow was? We're not going to eat or drink until we've killed Paul. Now, how would you like to have more than 40 people who said, I'm not going to eat or drink until I've killed you? I'd get worried about lunchtime if I were you. (laughs) I mean, and then dinner time? Give it a couple days? Friends, that's heavy. Paul's life was lived that much on the edge. No wonder he could say, I die daily, and this is his boast. Now, let me make an important point here. It's important to understand that when Paul says, I die daily, he is not speaking of the spiritual identification he has with the death of Jesus. He's not speaking of the spiritual putting to death of the flesh. He's writing of the constant, imminent danger to his physical life. Now, It is important and it is useful for a Christian to daily reckon themselves dead to sin with Jesus Christ. Romans 6.11 says, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yes, reckon yourself to be dead to sin. But friends, to use the statement of Paul's, I die daily, to support this idea of, a daily mortification spiritually, that's wrong because that's not what Paul's talking about in the context. Paul's talking about the danger to his physical life. But you know what? You can die daily too. You really can. You know how? Well, first of all, live every day of your life with the awareness that you're going to die. Next, Put to your soul by faith through the whole process of death. Think of yourself lying on your deathbed. You think I'm being morbid? You think I'm treading into ground that I shouldn't talk about? Friends, unless Jesus Christ comes first, every one of us is going to face death. And one of my solemn, sacred duties as a pastor is to prepare you for the day that you're going to die. You better think about it now. You better think about how you're going to testify to the glory and the goodness of Jesus Christ even on your deathbed. You should prepare yourself mentally and spiritually right now to look at death square in the face and to say, I'm coming home to you, Jesus. Do you want to die daily? Hold this world with a loosed hand. Test your hope and your experience every day. Come every day to Jesus Christ as a poor, guilty sinner needing forgiveness. You want to die daily? Live every day, every moment in a manner that you would not be ashamed to die at any moment. And finally, have your affairs in order. I'm telling you, friends. We're born to die. And every one of us is going to face it. And in that sense, we can die daily. Paul goes on in verse 32 and describes some of these life-threatening situations he was in. He says, if in the manner of men I fought with the beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? It's interesting because the book of Acts does not record an instance when Paul faced wild animals in an arena. It may be that this was just unrecorded, right? I mean, not everything in the life of Paul was recorded. 
Uh, or it may be that Paul is speaking figuratively. We know that he was kind of at the mercy of a mob in a riot at Ephesus. And maybe when he says beast, he's just referring to, you know, some wild men that he's sort of figuratively referring to as beasts. Who really knows? But the whole idea is that Paul faced all of this for the sake of the resurrection of the dead. And he knew it. And that's what sustained him. Notice this here in verse 32. He says, if the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Paul says, listen, if there is no resurrection, if this life is all there is, then you better, what was the old beer commercial? Grab all the gusto you can. Hey, why not? Why not? If this life is all there is, if, as as it says in the book of Ecclesiastes, all of life is just lived under the sun, then friends, if that's all there is, then go ahead, party it up. Get the most pleasure you can out of life right now because that's all you're ever going to enjoy. Friends, if there is a resurrection and if there is a God enthroned in heaven who says, at my hands are pleasures forevermore, then it makes sense to live your life righteously and godly for Him right now, right here. It's said that the ancient Egyptians at the end of a big party would take a wooden image of a man in a coffin and they would take it around to all the tables and they would say, take a look at this and have a good time now because you're going to be dead sooner than you think. Friends, if there is no resurrection, if there is no future judgment, then we may as well have the best time we can right now. And Paul was a fool for putting himself in such discomfort and danger for the sake of the gospel. But he was no fool, because there is a resurrection of the dead, and it does matter. He goes on, verse 33. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness, and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Friends, knowing the truth about our resurrection should affect the way that we live. Paul says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Now, it might seem strange to have this verse in here, right? Paul, why in the midst of this discussion of the resurrection do you throw in, you know, my peer group? What's up with that? Well, really, it's very simple. Where did the Corinthian Christians get their weird ideas about the resurrection? Ideas that Paul has spent this whole chapter trying to correct. They got this bad thinking by associating either with Jews who did not believe in the resurrection, such as the Sadducees, or with pagan Greek philosophical types who did not believe in the resurrection. Friends, it was bad enough that these associations had affected their thinking on an important matter like the resurrection, but this evil company could corrupt far more. You know what the problem was? You know, Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. No, the Corinthian Christians were being conformed to this world, and they were not having their minds transformed by the word of God and the renewing of their minds. No, my friends. They were keeping evil company and were being conformed to this world. Instead, they needed to be transformed. I want you to think about this. How much of the Corinthians' problem could be explained by this one verse, evil company corrupts good habits? I mean, if the Corinthians were hanging around with pagans and unbelievers to the extent that they had started believing what they believed about the resurrection, isn't that the source of a lot of their other problems too? I mean, think about it. Think about all the things Paul has had to deal with in this book. Envy, divisions, pride, immorality, greed, irreverence, selfishness. How much of this has come in because of their keeping of evil company? My friends, their problem with the resurrection was an indicator of the source of their moral problems also. They were keeping evil company and it was corrupting them. You want to know something else interesting about this? Do you notice when it says in verse 33, evil company corrupts good habits, how that's in quotation marks? But I don't know exactly how your Bible's laid out. In my Bible, it's evident by the way it's laid out that this is not a quotation from the Old Testament, but it's still a quotation from somebody. In other words, Paul's quoting somebody, but he's not quoting the Old Testament. 
Do you know what he's quoting? He's quoting an ancient playwright named Menander. And this guy was a pagan. But you know what? He was right on this point. And so Paul quotes him. And so he says in verse 34, instead of hanging around with this corrupt company, awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Listen, it's a sin to remain ignorant of the things of God. Now, verse 35. But someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Well, Paul says, well, you may have questions about the resurrection. What is it now to be resurrected? The first question is, how are the dead raised up? Can I just tell you something? Paul doesn't even really answer this question. I think it's a dumb question. How are the dead raised up? God does it. (laughs) I don't know. What more do you need to say than that? Acts 26.8 says, Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Listen, he's God. How do the dead raise up? How are the dead raised up? God does it. But then he goes on and he asks another question in verse 35. And with what body do they come? Now, this might be a foolish question, but Paul's going to answer it. You know how I know it's a foolish question? Look at verse 36. Foolish one. <laughs> By the way, in the literal Greek, it's even harsher. In the literal Greek, you'd pretty much read it like this. Fool. And then he goes on and he explains the answer. (laughs) Fool, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases and to each seed its own body. Paul says, let me tell you how the resurrection works. It works like a seed. You see, Paul says that our bodies are like seeds which grow into resurrection bodies. When you bury the body of a believer, you're sowing a seed which will come out of the earth as a resurrection body. Now think about that the next time you go to a cemetery. Just imagine that they're all believers. And you know what? You say, that's a fine crop you planted there, Lord. Look at the rows. Look at all that. They're all there. All seeds waiting to sprout up. Now, friends, it's going to happen right here. And why do we weep then when we bury somebody? I don't know. Uh, Of course we weep because of the grief at the moment and all that stuff. But in the long term, why? It must be a terrible thing to hear the the sound of dirt hitting the top of a coffin as that body's buried. But can you imagine a farmer going through his fields Planting the seeds and burying them. Oh, I'm burying the seeds. Oh, I'll never see them again. Oh, the seeds. Well, it's foolish, isn't it? The farmer's doing a good thing. And you're right. He's never going to see those seeds again, will he? He'll never see those seeds again. But he'll see something much more glorious that comes up from him. Friends, Spurgeon said, Dear friends, if such be death, if it be but a sowing... Let us be done with all faithless, hopeless, graceless sorrow. Our family circle has been broken, say you. Yes, but only broken that it may be reformed. You've lost a dear friend. Yes, but only lost that friend that you may find him again and find more than you lost. They are not lost. They are sown. And that's exactly how we should regard it. Now notice what he says here, though. You don't sow the body that shall be, but God gives it a body as he pleases, and each seed its own body. Friends, when you plant a wheat seed, a great big wheat seed doesn't grow up out of the ground. Something different from the wheat seed, yet related to it, grows up. So even though our resurrection bodies come from our present bodies, we should not expect that they will be our same bodies or just improved bodies. But they come from our bodies. Now, some people mock this. They say, okay, let's say here's a Christian just buried in a grave with no casket. And their body decomposes. And grass grows down and 
molecules or atoms of their decomposed body get absorbed by the grass and become part of the grass plant. And then a cow comes along and eats the grass plant. And the molecules of the grass plant uh, go into the cow's milk. And then a, another Christian drinks the molecules of that dead Christian and drinks it down and it becomes part of their body. What happens to those molecules? Which Christian will it be raised in? <laughs> Foolishness. <laughs> My friends, God does not need every atom of a man's body to make a resurrection body. You know, every cell of your and my body contains the DNA blueprint to make a whole new body. I don't doubt that God can take one atom of any one of us and from that, get the blueprint to make a whole new resurrection body. But I'll tell you, I guarantee you, I guarantee you something. God is going to take at least one atom from your body. Because your new body is going to be based upon your old body. I'm going on here, he says, verse 39. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another kind of flesh of beasts, and another of fish, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. Friends, all flesh is not the same flesh. There are different kinds of bodies in God's creation. But there are also celestial bodies, heavenly bodies. Our resurrection body will be a heavenly, that is a celestial body, suited for life in heaven, not only on this earth. But all flesh is not the same flesh. You see, Paul's trying to explain that the principle of resurrection isn't somehow biologically inherent in us. You know, biologically speaking, our bodies are not a whole lot different from the bodies of a gorilla or an ape, biologically speaking. But they're not going to rise from the dead because all flesh is not the same flesh. Man's flesh is informed or inspired by our immortal, reasonable soul. And not so the flesh of other creatures. Friends, you can't build upon this the doctrine of doggy heaven. Or kitty heaven. Or any other kind of pet heaven. Now some people are very troubled by this. Because they love their pets very much. And I don't have a firm answer for you. Because the scriptures are silent. But let me just say this. When you get to heaven. If you absolutely need your doggy or your kitty, for it to be heaven, then your dog or your kitty will be there. If they're not there, it won't matter to you, friends. So don't worry about it one way or the other. If it'll matter, they'll be there. If they're not there, it won't matter to you. God will take care of it. Now, friends, there's different kind of bodies, different kind of structures in the universe. There's the sun, there's the moon, the stars. Each one is created with its own glory, and it's suited to its own particular environment and needs. While our present bodies are adapted for our own environment of time and earth, our resurrection bodies will be adapted to the environment of eternity and heaven. And so he goes on to say here, if you notice here in verse 41, there's one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. Might I point out that some people have taken this verse, and I don't think it clearly teaches it, but it may mean it by inference, that there will be different degrees of glory for believers in heaven that not all believers will share the same degrees of glory. And I don't know. I don't know what the criteria will be. Maybe it'll be one of the manifestations of reward, but that is a possibility, that there will be different degrees of glory in heaven. Notice here verse 42. He says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Friends, there's four contrasts between our present body and the future resurrection body. Corruptible against incorruptible. Dishonor against glory. Weakness against power. Natural against spiritual. I just got to tell you, on all counts, that resurrection body wins. It's better. 
What happens to our bodies before the resurrection? What happens in that time period between weakness and power, between uh, corruption and incorruption? Well, we, we rot in the earth, our bodies do, but there will come a day when we are resurrected. Friends, did you see what it says here? Raised in incorruption, raised in glory, raised in power, our resurrection body will be glorious. God has given us a few glimpses in the scriptures what our resurrection body will be like. You think of the shining face of Moses when he came down from Mount Sinai. That's a little hint. You think of the glorious vision of Jesus Christ in the transfiguration. That's a little hint. You think of the shining countenance of Stephen as he was being stoned to death. That's a little indication. But friends, the resurrection is going to cure it all. In a book of martyrs, it says in old ancient England in the days of Queen Mary, they were going to burn two martyrs at the stake. And one of them was crippled and the other one was blind. And so the lame man, after he was fast and he was chained to the stake to be burned you know what he did with his crutch he said i'm not going to need this anymore i'm going to heaven he threw it away and he told the blind man to be of good comfort because death would heal them both and so they very patiently suffered as the flames came and took them to heaven <laughs> 